right, welcome back. Let's do dependent T now in contrast to independent T. So we'll ask the same question. Are invisible people mischievous? But this time what we'll do is we'll put people in that community with all of our big brother cameras. And for the first week, we'll just see what they do. Right? How crazy are they? And then the second week, we'll give them that invisibility cloak and see what happens. So everyone is getting both conditions, right? They're in the act normal, no cloak, and the cloak condition. And so we measured how many mischievous acts they performed in week one and week two. Now, this is the same data as before, but now is only tested on 12 participants. So the study is dependent. It's not 24 independent people, it's 12 dependent pairs. And let's see what happens to our t-test. You should not do this normally. This is an example to show you how power is affected by the statistical test, okay, and the research design. So let's move me back down here. And so what is happening in a dependent test in comparison to independent? Well, the logic is roughly the same, but we have to consider the peopleness in the study or the matched nature of those results. So by that, I mean that, um, brain fart, that I mean that the same people are tested twice. So that violates the assumption of independence and we have to do something about that. Okay, so we'll use um, uh, the different scores. So the simplest way to deal with independence when we have a binary uh, independent variable is just subtract. So what's the difference between your cloak and no cloak um, weeks? And you end up with one column of data. That's the difference between those two sets of scores. And then you run what's called a simple, uh, a single t-test right, on the differences. Okay. And that's what this is right here on the top. It's time one minus time two for each person. Okay. And that difference is compared to the assumption made by the null. The null hypothesis is that there are no group differences, more than likely. So this u sub d, this expected mean on of our difference score, is usually zero and drops out of the equation. And we'll use the standard error of the differences. Well, that's the standard deviation of the differences divided by the square root of n. And remember with our independent t-test, what we have was group one minus group two divided by this huge long formula to deal with the standard error because we had two different groups of people and we kind of had to juggle and weight their standard error. Now we have one group of people and we just create the standard error in the way that we always have. Okay. We just um, take time one, time two, subtract them and calculate the standard deviation and standard error on that different score. Okay. So the standard error of the differences is calculated by subtracting those two scores and then just running your regular SD function on it. This is actually easier than independent test because independent test requires you to calculate for group one and group two and then do all this um, kind of weighted averaging. Now in the data screening, it's roughly the same as before, but there's no homogeneity between groups because I only have one group. So no homogeneity because homogeneity implies that there are two different points, two different groups. We don't have that. We have one group of people tested twice, but I don't assume that the homogen that the, the variances in each test are the same because we've subtracted. We have one set of scores of differences and we have one you can't compare it to anything. So no homogeneity. Okay. All right. When the other assumptions are not met, mostly normality, okay, with small samples, you can use a Mann-Whitney U test or the Wilcoxon rank sum test. So there's a version of that for independency and a version of that for dependency. Now to run this, we, it's very similar. It's very subtle here. The only difference here is this, okay, parity equals true. So we do DV as uh, approximated by IV, our data set. Now I've left this in, okay, var.equal is true. It actually is ignored when you turn on parity equals true. 
but that's so I don't forget to turn it on in independent tea. So this is more of a brain thing for me. I just, I, you know, it gets ignored in dependent tea and it doesn't hurt me to include it. So I just always use it, but it does not actually matter. So if you set this to false, it will still run just a dependent tea test. Hey, this is the key component, parity equals true. Now let's look at our results here. Okay, we've got our T value. Notice our degrees of freedom are 11. Okay. Degrees of freedom for independent T was 12 minus one plus 12 minus one, 22. For, for dependent T, there's only 12 people total. And there's 24 data points, but those are 12 pairs. And the formula for degrees of freedom is sample size, not data points. So it's sample size, 12 people minus one, because we're calculating one mean on the differences. So you would think that with way less degrees of freedom, we would have less power, but that is not true. <laughs> we do have less power with less degrees of freedom, but the controlling for the peopleness is a larger effect usually. So controlling for the fact that they're just different, natural differences between people by subtracting them and creating just a change score is often will give us more power. Now I do actually wanna, I need to back up for a second and say something, but like when we load this data set, okay, there is an assumption, let's bring this back away. Right? If this is dependent T and we have it in long format, there is assumption that this is participant one and this is also participant one. So it's gonna subtract them in the same order. Okay, the data set does have to, well, it doesn't, technically it doesn't have to be in long format, but we're gonna pretend like it does, okay? So the data, you can use it in long format here, and it will assume that this is participant one and this is participant one. But if we've melted our data from a word that we probably haven't heard in a while from the beginning of the semester, if we took the data and reshaped it, that is what format this will be in. So um, there is an assumption here that it's subtracting here three minus four. So why is this result different from independent T, even though it's technically the same data? And in theory, this one has less degrees of freedom, so it should have less power. Okay. Now this test actually is significant, even though the mean difference is the same, but the denominator is what's different here. So in a dependent test, you're calculating the standard error on the differences. The different scores naturally have less variance than the overall data, usually, because you have controlled for the differences between people. So a repeated measures design often has way more power than a between subjects design just because we can control for those kind sort of inherent differences in people. And that's cool. <laughs> that's a good thing. Because if you're going to make them take it twice, you might as well get something out of it, right? Now, ethically, we can't always do everything as repeated measures, and sometimes studies just don't work as repeated measures. So between subjects has its place. Now, okay, it's significant, but shouldn't this be the same effect as independent tests, the same data, okay, in this example? And there are a couple of Cohen's Ds that we can calculate that control for peopleness. And one of them is Cohen's D is based on averages. So we're going to call this DAV. Okay. And this calculates like sort of, um, you know, time one minus time two divided by the average standard deviation. So that actually matches the formula for independent T. Okay. It doesn't control for the correlation between time one and time two. DRM looks at both standard deviations and actually does control for that correlation. Then there's also DZ, which is more, um, it's similar to the test statistic. So it's the difference scores divided by the standard deviation of the differences, rather than the difference scores divided by the average standard deviation. Okay, those are two slightly different things. Okay. So which one should I use? Okay. The Cohen's DZ matches the test statistic. These are transforms of each other. In independent T, Cohen's DS matches the test statistic. So if you want to match the test statistic, use DZ. 
However, we know that DZ is an overestimator. It tends to be uh, overestimate the effect size. And so a lot of people suggest using DAV, okay, D averages. Uh, I don't have any good feelings for D averages versus DRM. Okay, so using that correlation or not, I tend to do D averages. It's just my, it's my favorite one. Um, but you can control for the correlation if you'd like, if you have the, re the raw data. If you don't have the real data and you're looking at it like in a journal publication, you probably have enough information to calculate D averages. Okay, and that's more likely what people are going to print is the mean and standard deviation for each time point. All right, so let's look at that. Okay, so I'm going to do D dot dependent T based on averages. Okay, mean one, mean two. Okay, uh, standard deviation one and two, and only one in because okay, there's one set of pairs. And so that's the difference between the uh, formula we saw before. Check it out. It estimates at, D, uh, at 0 0.70. If you've taken a real mental break between these videos, as a reminder, the independent T1 was 0 0.699. So, you know, these two match. And this makes a lot of sense to have them match. If I calculated DZ, it's a little bit kind of a pain actually with the data the way that we have it set up. Um, so you don't normally calculate both, right? That's because then you would just report the large one. So don't do that. Pick one beforehand. But um, I, what I did here was I calculated the difference. So I said, okay, take the cloak group minus the no cloak group. Okay, my data set. So this is just some su subsetting. And then on that difference score, do d dot dependent t dot diff. Okay, our mean difference is the mean of those difference scores. Our standard deviation of the difference is the standard deviation of the difference scores. And in here is how many different scores I have, which is twelve. And notice here how it's it's much larger. Okay, so dz tends to overestimate. It's too big. And we don't want to overestimate our effects. We just, we want to overestimate standard deviation from a mini lectures back, but we don't want to overestimate our effects. Okay? Because then we're saying that maybe they're more important than they really are. Okay? So st statistics aren't perfect. Some of them have known problems and DZ is one of them. Okay. Now power, how many people did I actually need? Because I, I ran 12, which is a small sample. You should really run more than that. <laughs> but like, how many people did I, did I need given the effect size? Okay, we're going to use our effect size of 0.7. Okay. And so the test type affects power. Remember that our independent T with an effect size of 0.7 suggested 66 people or 33 in each group. We'll do the same thing. It's like like almost exactly the same, except now type is paired instead of two dot sample. Come down here, right? And it says I only need 18 people. So it actually says I need more people than I have. <laughs> so interesting, we're underpowering our, our study here. Um, <clears throat> but we would need 18 people, okay, to get this effect size. Okay. Now, that is the number of pairs. So it's literally 18. It's not 18 times two. Okay. That's, that is the big key thing I wanted to point out in this lecture. Um, really hammering on the fact that you need to match the statistic run to the data type. Okay. It's either repeated or it's between. But if, for an example, we look at it both ways, you can see now, something that we talked about many moons ago about how power is affected by the statistical test, okay, which is chosen based on the data, data collection type. Okay. So you can't run dependent T just because you want to. You need to have that data. But if you have the opportunity to test people m across multiple times, it's a pain, <laughs> especially if you have like a, a delay between them, the two, um, that has its own problems of people disappearing and things happening and lots of things you can't control. But if you can test people over time, it will give you more power in your statistical test. All right, now how do I visualize this data? Okay. So this is a bar chart in ggplot2 with one variable. 
Okay, your different levels. So this is going back to kind of week four. I have my cleanup code, right? So I just, I cut and pasted this from that lecture. So let's see here, we've got our cloak variable as our X independent, um, X axis, our mischief variable is our dependent variable. Okay. And then we just do all of our stat summary. So remember that this one here calculates the mean score and builds a bar. This here calculates the 95% confidence interval and um, build some bars for us. Okay, now do this does assume different groups. So these confidence intervals aren't perfect for repeated measures designs because it treats them as separate groups. Okay. And then we add an X and Y label. So this is really, this is better for between subjects. Now, if I wanted to do this for repeated measures, but I wanted to calculate kind of controlling for the fact that it's the same group, I would probably get, um, I might do a different score instead. Okay. One bar looks a little silly though, but you can also uh, manually draw the bars on. All right, so in summary, across both lectures, what we've learned is all things t-tests, independent and dependent t. Do know that there are t-tests called single sample t's which are mathematically equivalent to dependent T's on like one column of data. Okay. The logic of T-tests, kind of the null hypothesis is that there are no differences between times or between groups. And if we find that there are differences um, where the signal to noise ratio of mean differences over error, that's probably because these are different populations, okay. two different groups or the manipulation between time points created those differences, okay. um, specifically in independent and dependent T's and effect sizes for those. And a little bit on the current debate on which effect size is the most appropriate for them. Okay. Last, we ended with power and graphs. So we've covered how do I know how many people I should have based on some previous studies for effects and how to visualize the group differences. Okay. So that's it for T-tests. We're wrapping it up next week with our final lecture on ANOVAs, which are t-tests uh, expanded to having more than two groups.